Good morning, Goshen Baptist. My name is David Nichols, and I serve as an elder here at Goshen. And it is summertime, and we wanted to share with you some sun, summer Sunday school lessons, even if virtual, like some of our other services. This first week, I've asked the elders to share with you some testimony, some testimonies of uh, their life during quarantine, uh, some verses or some songs or maybe some experiences that have been special to them and how God's spoken to them during this time of quarantine. And this is, is certainly unusual times. Uh, I recently saw a list of things that Americans are, are buying uh, during the quarantine, and uh, some things that are record sales are kind of surprising. Uh, puzzles, uh, games, books, knitting equipment, baking equipment are all having record sales. And you may look at that list and say, wow, maybe we're returning to more simpler times in our country. Uh, but also on that list were things like guns and alcohol and pornography. And you see that and you think, wow, maybe these are more troubling times. But certainly you wouldn't argue that these are quite unusual times in our country. And uh, at unusual times, who does God call to help out during these times? You may think that, wow, God's going to call the best of the best to help us during these unusual times. And sometimes God does. And when I think of the best of the best, a recent example uh, I think of is Michael Jordan from watching The Last Dance. I was so impressed how he's uh, an elite athlete playing at an elite level with other great athletes, but how he was able in most of the time to uh, still excel above the best. And you would certainly say he is the best of the best when it came to basketball players during his time. So certainly that's who God is gonna look to during, during challenging times, but that was not always the case. And uh, a devotion that I had came from Judges 6. And this was about 12th century BC. It was a time when the Midianites were harassing the Israelites and they were stealing their crops and they were stealing their livestock and making their life unbearable such that many of the Israelites were hiding in caves and calling on God saying, God, you have to help us. Gideon himself was in hiding and, and working his crops uh, in secret not to be seen by the Midianites. And it's at this point where uh, Judges chapter 6 uh, takes place. I'm going to read for you parts of uh, verses 12 through 16. And it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us? And then verse 14, And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you will strike the Midianites as one man. Great scripture there where Midian says, God, my clan is the weakest, and I'm the least. How can you want me to go do this? And God said, But I will be with you, and you will strike the Midianites as one man. God doesn't always call the best of the best. We see this in Scripture all the time. He calls and wants to use us and use us through His might. You could think of Abraham and Sarah and how Abraham at 100 and Sarah at 90 birthed a great nation. Or how about Moses who told God he could not speak, but God told him to go speak to the mightiest ruler of the land at the time to deliver the people of Israel. What about Rahab who was a prostitute? But yet she hid the spies and through her faith was able to save her entire family. Or about Ruth. She was a, a Moabite widow immigrant that uh, became the great-grandmother of King David. Or look at King David himself. He was a small, young, ruddy shepherd that God called to be the king of Israel. And God told us what he looks for in 1 Samuel 16, 7. He said, man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. So God's looking at our heart. And I ask ourselves, what is God calling us to do? Don't look at our weaknesses, but look at what God can do. Look at what God in his strengths can do through us. So what is God calling me to do during this exceptional time? What is God calling you to do during this exceptional time? Certainly some things to ponder. Good morning, Goshen family. Pastor Peter here, joining the other elders to share about our quarantine experience. Very strange time uh, for all of us. Certainly a very strange time to be a pastor or a church elder. I would never have predicted that this was coming, uh, you know, didn't see it coming. 
uh, in advance. And yet, uh, taking this season for uh, having our services remotely and not meeting together in person has been the right thing to do, certainly for public health reasons, for the protection of one another, protecting of our neighbors that we want to love. And this, this too shall pass. Um, but in the meantime, what's it, what's it been like? So uh, I would say for me, uh, more than usual, I've been tempted in this season to let current events sort of run my life. Um, I've been a reactor, reactionary response. Uh, the constant flow of news media is, uh, is pushing in this direction. So think back. Uh, before coronavirus, uh, center stage in our national attention was occupied by the presidential primaries. Remember that? Wasn't there a presidential primary race going on? And then uh, the coronavirus hit, virtually erasing the presidential primaries and dominating the news. How would this play out, this pandemic? How many cases, how many fatalities? Would there be a vaccine? So on and so forth, constant coverage. And then on Memorial Day, the brutal killing of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis claims center stage. It, it just explodes onto center stage of the national attention, 24-7 coverage, along with the huge wave of demonstrations, protests, as well as a lot of destruction and chaos. And in the midst of all of that, coronavirus is almost forgotten. So we've become a culture of, of one thing. We pay attention to one thing at a time, it seems. And we're constantly reacting to what is the most current thing in front of us. Now, of course, each of these things that I mention is big. It's important. The presidential election, the pandemic, nationwide outcry over racism. These are big and important things. Each one deserves attention. But media drives fixation onto one thing, drives it into the ground. After all, this is a way of, of holding viewers. It sells ads. And we buy in and play the game with our impatience and short attention spans. So during stay at home, I I've been pulled by this. Uh, the pull is strong. And I've had to cut myself off from the, the news many times, just walk away from it. Uh, especially so that I can make sure that the center of my mind and my heart is not overrun by the latest thing. To put it differently, I I've been trying, with mixed success, to subordinate the one thing of popular culture to the one thing I most need and that we all most need. Or to say it yet another way, uh, I've been battling to make sure that the throne at the center of my life is occupied by Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ is shaping my mind and my view of current events that are swirling all around us. Or to say it yet one more way, the battle of quarantine has been to keep the main thing the main thing, even as temptations of fear flood our screens, political fear, economic fear, public health fear, civil unrest fear, and, and fear is like a virus. It spreads and expands and eventually it engulfs our hearts if we will let it. A couple of weeks ago I got to preach on Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is a great passage that uh, begins with a word about fear and has an urgent message about the one thing thinking that we need. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid, says King David. So fear not. Now in the next couple of verses after that, David goes on to say, no matter what happens, whatever happens to him, even if war breaks out, we could say, uh, even if a pandemic strikes, he says, my heart shall not fear. And then, in the midst of all of the threats coming at him, David declares, Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing, to be in God's presence. And I would say, now as much as ever, don't let current events swamp your life 
your attention. Get with the Lord. Reminds me of what Jesus says to busy Martha in Luke chapter 10. He says to her, one thing is necessary. Referring to the good portion that her sister Mary had chosen by opting not to join in with the uh, serving group, uh, caring for the guests, but instead she sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. One thing. That was the one thing necessary to get in the Lord's presence. The Apostle Paul describes his own relentless pursuit of Christ this way in Philippians 3. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. To serve and to honor Christ is Paul's grand obsession, the one thing that puts every other thing in life into proper perspective. And so, as followers of Jesus, we need to know what's going on in the world, absolutely. We need to be open and aware. Our hearts need to go out to our, our, our neighbors. We need to hear them, share in their pain, seek their good. We need to pursue justice, all of that, yes. But only if our hearts first are full of Christ will we be fit to react rightly to all that's going on in the current events and the turmoil of our times. Good morning, Goshen. Um, my name is Daryl Tedrow. I'm an elder at Goshen Baptist Church. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what God has been revealing to me um, through COVID and even going back a little farther than that over the last year or so. Um, one of the things, about a year ago, we had a men's retreat um, with Goshen Baptist Church and the um, Vivek Jones spoke and he spoke on The Praying Life by Paul Miller. It's a book by Paul Miller. And he really went through a lot about how you pray to God. And, and the thrust of it was don't be afraid to be transparent with God. Um, you know, lament if you need to lament, uh, speak your desires if you have desires, and, and just lay out um, with transparency what you feel with God. Don't be afraid of that. And it was very helpful for me. I think I found I, I was praying what God, what I thought God wanted me to pray rather than what I was feeling. And it seems a little silly to, to try to, to not be transparent with someone who's all knowing, but I found a way to do it. Um, so anyway, so it was an interesting experience for me. It really changed the way I prayed and really taught me to pray my desires. Um, and it's interesting, in Psalm 37, um, they say that if you delight yourself in the Lord, God will give you the desires of your heart. Um, and there's, there's two parts to that. There's a command that we should delight ourselves in the Lord. Um, it's important to understand that that's a command that's given. It's something that's expected. Um, there's lots of commands in the Bible that really command our emotions. They um, rejoice in the Lord, command us how to be, how to act, how to feel. Um, and as such, um, that's a command that we're given. It's something we should try to follow. It's also obviously, um, uh, there's a promise that's attached to it, mainly that if you delight yourself in the Lord, um, he will give you the desires of your heart. And what that really tells you is twofold. One, God either wants to grant us our desires or he wants to change our desires. There's no real middle ground because if, if we're delighting ourselves in the Lord as he commands, he will give us the desires of our heart. Um, you know, and the Christian life is not about, um, and, I, and I made this mistake in the past in my life, the Christian life is not about looking longingly at things that you've given up for Christ and wishing you had them. That, that's not what Christ expects from us. He, he is willing to work with us to change our desires. Um, he wants us to desire after him. You know, and ultimately, um, Paul was able to um, look back and he actually said he counts the things that he had given up as rubbish. I think one translation may say dung. So very harsh language about, about how the stuff that just didn't matter relative to knowing the surpassing glory of Christ. Um, you know, one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is the story of Moses. Um, and what I like about it is when Moses, Moses looked like he was a man that was ready to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, he was a prince of Egypt. He seemed like the perfect candidate, and that wasn't when God used him. Um, when he was 40 and he was a prince of Egypt, God didn't use him. When he was 80, when he was a shepherd murderer who stuttered, that was who God used. Um, and what I'd always gotten out of that story before was that um, Moses was really a man who God needed to break so that people would know like it was his, it was God's greatness that led the people out of Egypt, not Moses's. So it's important that it be God's glory for that, not Moses's. And that, that made sense and that's definitely true. What I had missed was when Moses was 40, he had killed a man. Um, and Stephen in Acts actually tells us why he had done it. He had done it because he wanted to lead, uh, free the Hebrews. He had a desire in his heart to free the Hebrews. And God actually, no doubt, placed that desire there. In fact, he intended to have him fulfill it. It just wasn't until he was 80. But what that told me that Moses' whole life, post 80 years old, was fulfilling a, a desire that he had in his heart. God was rewarding him 
with allowing him to do something he wanted to do. And, and as a result of that, what you saw was, a, you know, what we saw was God using Moses powerfully. So it's really such a great story of, of how important the desires of our heart are to God using us. He wants us seeking after his glory. He wants us seeking after his aims. And when they align, there's, there's such power in that. Um, I have a quote I want to share with C.S. Lewis, and I'll have to read it off my phone because I didn't memorize it. But I did just want to share this with you because it's very powerful. Um, Moses said, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea, we are far too easily pleased. And that's just um, so powerful to think about that. You know, when you look at the Bible and it talks about things like self-denial, it almost always follows it with a promise. Um, it is really in our best self-interest to obey God long term. Like, we will be glorified for that. And that's such a powerful promise. And, and I think sometimes we lose sight of it and we think well, we're just supposed to sacrifice and sacrifice. And we have a master who is going to reward us bountifully. And, and it's okay to look forward to that. That's why the Bible puts those promises in there, is that an eternal glory awaits us. And, you know, we're, we're playing playing in the mud, in the mud um, with these things. So anyway, it's just been very powerful in my life. Um, definitely led to some, some changes really in how I view things and how I really seek after God's will. I, I'm not the most natural, uh, most emotional person. I, 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 when I think I don't think about desires as being a high priority of something I need to change, but it's something God's really been working on in my life. So um, hope you guys are all staying safe during COVID and just God bless. And Jesus. Good morning, Goshen family, and greetings from Northwest Iowa, where we are busy getting our vacation cottage open for the summer. Davis, Molly, and I drove across seven states the last couple of days to get here, including Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. Got them all. And as we were driving across those states, took us about 22 hours of drive time, we had a lot of time to talk. One of the things that we talked about was we were excited to see her father. We haven't seen her father since her mother's memorial service earlier this year. It's been a hard time. We miss family. We miss Molly's family. We miss my family. We miss our church family. We have all missed so much. But we also, we all have so much. During this time, it, was, it became easy for me to focus on what I no longer have. In fact, at times it was probably like a pity party. But early in the quarantine, my morning time moved me into Romans. What a great book for me. It's been a reminder. Frankly, it's been a slap in the face of what I have through Jesus Christ. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ who died for us. Our family may be physically separated. Many things we look forward to are, have been impacted. And yes, it has been difficult. And I see more difficult times in front of us. But I'm reminded that together we are, that we are spiritually together as believers. We will also be together eternally. Each morning, Romans has allowed me to take a, a deep breath, to focus on what I have, and see things differently. Romans has been a reminder that when I get down, focus eternally, that generally what brings me down are worldly things. I love the verse from Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I've challenged myself to see God, his peace, in the quietness, the stillness, the craziness that we've been forced into. For me, I've been using his creation to see God through his birds, which there are many around here and many in our yard, <coughs> through the flowers that have come up through spring, it's amazing to me that we have a God that has an imagination beyond what we could ever see. And this time has given me a time to see his peace during the quietness that I don't normally experience. 
As I think about this, I'm reminded that God's word is timeless. It speaks to us no matter what the situation. I encourage you to spend time in the word to see how it will speak to you. It has had a great impact for me, and I know it will for you. I miss all of you, and I can't wait to see you again. God bless. Good morning. I'm Larry Smith, and I'm one of the elders at Goshen Baptist Church. It's really uh, great to be with you this morning as we're able to still communicate with each other using this video technology. Many of you know my wife, Barb, who is very actively involved at the church also. I would like to share with you a few reflections and thoughts I have on the whole pandemic situation that we've all been going through today as it relates to my family and my spiritual growth. First, you may notice that I actually got a haircut yesterday. That's the first time I got a haircut in three months. Some of you may be in that same situation, and I actually had to go to Delaware to get that haircut. They've recently opened up barber shops again. Also, I've got this full beard for the first time in my life, and uh, it sure makes it a lot easier shaving now. I don't know how long it's going to last as it gets hot in the summer, but it's kind of my pandemic beard. I thought it would be boring, perhaps, as we needed to spend so much time here at home and there wouldn't really be much to do and it would seem like wasted time. But you know what? That really hasn't turned out to be the case. I've been actually very surprised how busy I've been during this time period and for a number of different reasons. Uh, one would be, as some of you know, I work part-time at Ryder University and they've had more Zoom meetings than I can ever imagine. We certainly had more Zoom meetings than we ever had face-to-face -face meetings. So that's been part of it. And of course, Barb is very good at finding jobs that need to be done. And there were lots of jobs that legitimately needed to be done around the house. And now it seems like I have more time to be able to do some of that. Also, I've tried to stay very engaged with Goshen Church during this time period. And we've had things like our worship services on Sundays. We've also uh, had men's Bible study, which continued throughout this whole time period. And uh, we had our elder studies going on during this time period, as well as our regular elder meetings. And also there was, were some building and property activities going on. So the combination of all these things has kept me relatively busy, but I've still had time to reflect back and think a little bit more on my, really my spiritual growth and my faith story. And as I do, I think back to 1966, when a traveling evangelist named Harry Denman actually visited our church for a series of revival services. And during one of those services, I remember Harry talking about that each of us need to, needed to accept Jesus as our own Lord and Savior and become saved. And if we didn't do that, we would end up going to hell when we died. And I'll tell you what, I never had really understood that before until he spelled it out in very clear language. And it was very effective with me. And so I didn't want that to happen. I took that to heart and accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior that week. And although I've regularly attended church all throughout the rest of junior high and high school and through college, uh, I really probably didn't continue to grow spiritually very much until after Barb and I got married and then later when we begin, began to have children. And as I think back on this, one of the next really big events I think about is when I was baptized. Now, when I was a baby, my parents had me baptized at the church we attended regularly. But of course, that really wasn't a baptism. That was more of a christening. So when I was an adult in, on October 21st, 2007 at Valley View Chapel in northern New Jersey, I was immersion baptized and had the opportunity to share 
my faith story with everybody at that service. But what made that even a more exciting and outstanding day for me was that three of my children were also baptized that same day, that Michael, Jordan, and Rachel. And Pastor John, after I was baptized, invited me to stay in the baptismal tub with him. And I had the wonderful opportunity to actually help him baptize each of my children. And that just makes that, of course, a very special day that I think about. And then later, when Cheyenne joined us and we became part of our family, on July 15th, 2015, Cheyenne was baptized at Goshen Baptist Church. So as I begin to think about uh, wrapping things up today, let me share a verse with you that, that is special to me and has special meaning between my daughter Rachel and I. And that is Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. And I know many of you are familiar with this. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I fearfully and wonderfully made. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained to me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So with that, I'll wrap up my time with you today. Hope that you have a good rest of the day and a great week. Stay healthy and safe. And I hope to see you all again face-to-face -face very soon.